Hey people. Well, today's video about pigs, most particularly wild pork. Um, a fantastic, a fantastic food. Considering that pig hunting is probably one of the most popular forms of hunting in Australia, if not the world actually, if not the world, one of the oldest, most continuous forms of, of hunting that we've engaged in. Um, it's really interesting that Australia is one of the only parts of the world where eating wild pork is somewhat considered a, I don't know, a risky hygiene, health hazard, um, controversial thing. I don't know, if you said that to a European, they might really be taken aback by you, because considering that for a while, we were import exporting wild pigs over to the European market for human consumption. You think, well, hang on, why aren't, you know, why aren't we doing the same? As in, why aren't we eating our own wild pigs? A lot of people do. A lot of people don't. And I think one of the major causes for that is just the uncertainty. And it's legitimate. It's not about, you know, thinking, oh, I don't know, I just don't want to eat that. It's like, no, there might be a serious health concern. I'm hoping that this video, I might just be able to share what knowledge I have and a little bit of research that I might have done over the years about just how I eat wild pork and do it safely and they're not sick. So I'm really hoping we can make this more of a conversation and if there's anyone out there who knows more than the rest of us about this topic um, and has any specific information, please chuck it in the comments below so we can just keep, make this a bit of a resource for new hunters in many respects. So I want to bring up a few factors in this video. I want to talk about firstly the kind of terrain and environment that you might find healthy wild pigs in. Um, what we are looking for, particularly in an animal themselves, um, the kind of pig we're after. Um, some telltale signs of disease and how we can prepare ourselves by just examining organs and what to look for in that respect. Um, but mainly our preparation, our hygiene and how we cook the animal before we feed ourselves and our friends and family with it. Now, pigs can survive in all kinds of different territory. Um, you'll find mobs of 100 plus just charging around western New South Wales on the fringe of the desert. You think, well, geez, what are they? How do they survive out there? Well, they 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 struggle to survive, and that's that's the point. I mean, they're largely carnivorous out there. They're mainly eating meat, which um, well, they eat whatever they can get, I guess. But that's not actually going to give them the energy as animals to be strong and healthy and survive for long periods of time. Um, also, eating meat. I'm happy to be correct if I'm wrong, but that seems like a major source of spreading diseases, whether they're eating meat of other animals or if they're eating their meat of other pigs, which does happen quite a lot. Um, so it doesn't make for a healthy pig for them just to be eating meat. On top of that, it also massively increases their risk of disease. Kind of leads on to the population question. If you've got a high level of pigs in a, in a dense space or just a high level of pigs in an area, there's a far greater likelihood um, that they'll be spreading disease to one another. It's just, it's just a question of numbers. Um, so when it comes to my own personal hunting areas, I'm mainly hunting along the Great Dividing Range. There'd be Central West, Snowy Mountains, down in Victoria, anywhere in between that I can find good land to hunt on, it's, it's on that section. So hilly mountainous country, higher quantities of water, there's a higher proportion of feed there, without any doubt. But also I don't see the same density well, the pigs are there. The pigs are all throughout. Don't get me wrong. That's why a lot of really good pig hunters hunt the mountain country. But you don't have that intense density of animals. So those factors, the fact that they are on a more of a vegetarian diet, um, which helps them put on fat, put on weight, that's, that's healthy for an animal. Um, and less exposure to heaps of other animals, I feel that helps with the disease question. I also want to think about, just for animals that I'm selecting themselves, I'm after younger animals, um, and I think this goes for a lot of different species of animals that we eat as human beings, is that younger animals are often more tender, um, better flavour. When I say better flavour, maybe a lot of people find it to be less of a strong flavour. Now, I only once um, ate some boar, and um, from a big old one, and yeah, um, pretty full-on flavour. I know some people absolutely love that. That's great. A few things go on in my mind. Yet yeah, strong flavour. I'm like, oof, okay, a bit full-on. Maybe I can spice it up. But also, a large boar has had a long time in its life 
to contract a whole bunch of different illnesses. Now, it has survived that long, and survivability is a good sign because most animals, when they get sick, will die pretty shortly afterwards. Um, but it's got to have all that time to pick up things like ticks, um, which can spread spread illness. Um, it could just be a carrier for all kinds of different stuff, and it doesn't taste that great. Don't stop hunting boars, but that's there's more than just the flavour issue about me not eating them. I choose a younger pig because in their short lifespans they've had less exposure to disease and if it's at a time of year where it has been very wet and they're on a good pasture and they're eating well, they're probably not ravaging the rotting corpses of other animals which they can then contract diseases from. Um, and more to the point, just smaller mobs, lots of ground to feed on, they're going to be a healthier, fatter, good looking pig. Um, again on the animals themselves, I always look for the neck. The neck's a really good indicator. If you've got a thin neck on a, on a pig, that means that yes, it, there's barely any weight on it at all. Um, it's not healthy. Uh, ribs on the side, if they're showing that kind of thing. They haven't been on a good pasture, they're not doing well. But if you're in an area where like, well hang on, there's other pigs, there's other animals doing perfectly well here, not necessarily in the midst of a drought or anything like that, you think, red flag, something's no good with this animal. There was an example of one I shot at the beginning of last year. Um, where it was a pretty long shot, off the bipod, oof, I'm like wow, I see a little mob going along, sour, oh, you're right. came you're up right. to it, like cool, roll it over to start chopping into it, ticks everywhere on the thing, so I don't know whether that was the cause or the source of its unwellness, but um, I remember them just jumping all over my hands, that's the first thing, I wouldn't go, go near it, started slicing into its back line, the back straps were no thicker than a 50 cent piece, Think well, okay, this is a withering animal, it's not well, it's not healthy. It's just a red flag. It just means, you know what, this is not a great animal to eat. Let's not eat it. I'm very glad I shot it anyway. So let me just talk about a few major higher profile diseases that we might want to be um, wary of. Uh, last year, the DPI released a warning. I think most our licensed hunters got an email that brucellosis was a big thing around the Tamworth area. Now, brucellosis, I've heard a lot of that, that in, in cattle. Yes, it goes through pigs as well. It can get into animals like your dogs, especially if you're a pig dogger, um, and human beings, we can contract brucellosis. As far as I understand, it's a blood-borne disease. Bacterial, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm happy to be corrected. If you hear about that kind of thing broadly in an area, well, yes, it's a source of alarm, I probably wouldn't take the chance of eating any pigs from that area whatsoever. I mean, so from my understanding, if it's a bacterial thing, properly cooking it and careful hygiene and taking it out of the bush, not allowing anything to get into like, I don't know, cut scrapes or accidentally in your mouth just by being really loose with your hygiene, wearing gloves and all that, that could help. For me, probably wouldn't even take the chance. Would it stop me going pig hunting though? Hell no! Shoot them! Shoot wild pigs! They're a terrible pest. I'm all about utilization of our game animals, don't get me wrong. But there's no reason for us to stop killing pigs. Lessening, you know, lessening the populations, taking that density down, is only going to be a, a pro thumbs up for livestock health, the health of the pigs themselves that we want to eat. Um, it's the well-being of the environment. Like, I don't think I need to sell it to you guys. Treat wild pigs, please. Don't stop shooting wild pigs. But something like that, if there's a warning in the area, boom. Right, I'm going to keep away from them. I'm going to be really careful. Um, I remember, what's another one? Tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, that's a human-born disease as well. Have a good inspection of the, the organs. You're looking particularly at the liver before anything else. If the liver's beautiful and healthy, it's just... It's beautiful and red. Like, you, you can tell when you hold it. You know, take a healthy deer or something like that, take the liver out, and you're like, wow, cool. It's just nice, rich, dark red, and no unusual bits and pieces on it. To double-check that, probably want to make some slices down through the liver to check it internally. You're looking for white spots more than anything else. That could be on, you know, externally or chunks of it within the liver. The other thing you're looking for is um, fluke, liver fluke, like where you get your hands and you might feel the edges and if you're feeling any hardening or just feel like little I don't know, tumors, lesions, something like that and you hold on to it, bar out. It's just red signs, it's just red flags, warning signs going off in your head. Um, Maybe worth even having a look at the lungs and other um, organs and like the pancreas and stuff like that, kidneys. Why not just, just have a look at all of it? Um, if there's any abnormalities in that, you should think red flag up, probably not going to eat this animal. 
when it comes to how we prepare and cook wild pork, I don't think it's any, I don't think it's particularly complicated in any respect. I mean, just basic hygiene as you're taking it out of the bushes is one thing. Um, one thing that I, I have to admit that I don't do all that often, but I should do more is just a pair of latex gloves um, when you're handling these animals, mainly just for for bloodborne stuff. But again, I've never really been at risk of that, so. Maybe I'm being a bit loose, maybe I should fix that up. But the main thing we can do is just cook wild pork properly. It has to be cooked all the way through. That will deal with a l huge number of different bacterial disease problems. Um, like I know there's one great example um, I saw on that meat eater show. Steve Rinella eats a black bear that hasn't been um, cooked all the way through. He gets trichinosis. And yeah, I mean he describes, you can look it up on the internet, it describes what that's like. But that's only just because they didn't give it the full treatment and cook it entirely all the way through. Um, it's so simple. Um, that's why you know I use mince in a lot of my wild pork recipes because it's something I can make sure that it's fully cooked through all the way through. One thing that I would avoid doing, even though I have seen some legends on the internet do it well, curing wild pork is something I personally don't do. Please, chuck in some corrections if uh, you feel like I'm on the right track here. But um, I saw a guy putting up wild pork salami the other day. Um, I've seen some people try and do hams and stuff like that on the net. I think, well, you know, I want to do that so badly. I'm just not going to. I always, I always freeze my wild pork beforehand, and then I always cook it entirely all the way through properly. That's that's just kind of my rule with wild pork. That's what I do. I would encourage most of you guys to do exactly the same. If when it comes to things like curing, you have another point of view on that, I'd like to hear about it because. The idea of wild pork ham sounds amazing, let alone prosciutto or something sexy like that, that'd be mad. But from my perspective, it must be cooked all the way through. That's just, there's, there's no two ways around that. And on that note, after talking about sick animals and diseases, uh, let's focus more on healthy animals and beautiful free range wild meat. I'm going to show you guys how to make sang choy bao. Something I've enjoyed since a kid, but once I started integrating that with wild pork, oh my god. Mwah! Good times. Alrighty. All we need is... I'm upping all these quantities today because Mitchell's over and we're going to have a big feed. Half a kilo of pork mince is actually almost close to a kilo, but that's fine. Water chestnuts. Chopped up onion. That's more than a chopped up onion. Iceberg lettuce. And for the sauces, oyster, soy, sesame oil, and we're going to do ginger and garlic. And of course you need oil. Good times. useful to some. I think more than anything just getting the conversation started is, a, is the hard, well no I'll tell you what the heart of it is, is the fact that there is a resource out there and if we're careful and we're thoughtful about it we can use it to a wonderful effect. Um, yeah remember this is a conversation so if you've got any alternative points of view or information that we don't have please share it but otherwise I'm going to have some more beers and I have some sanctuary bow so maximum respect comes natural. Mmm, it's fantastic! Oh my god! Ah, oh, fuck's sake! Covered in blood.